Hello there, my name is T. Erin Gruber and I use she, her pronouns. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Level Up Symposium presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I am a member of the Board of Directors of the ADC and really excited to host your event today. To begin our session today, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently located on Treaty 6 territory. This is the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Edmonton, as it is known colonially, is and has been home to a diverse range of Indigenous nations and peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Sutsina, Inuit, and many others. Since time immemorial, this land has been a meeting place for this diverse range of Indigenous peoples who have enriched this place with their histories, languages, and cultures. As a settler, I have benefited from gen Indigenous generosity, hospitality, and knowledge. And for that, I wish to express my deep gratitude. In this spirit of gratitude, I would like also to acknowledge the support of Canada Council for the Arts, our primary funder of the symposium as a whole, as well as our dedicated member volunteers and volunteers on the board of the ADC who have made this symposium possible. Thank you. This event is sponsored, uh, sorry, we are equally grateful to these additional sponsors, IATSE, University of British Columbia, CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, and York University. For your information, all symposium events will be recorded and presented in a freely available archive. Check back in a few days after any event you've missed to see the recording at levelup.designers.ca. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are watching this Level Up live stream either on the Level Up website, levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound at howlround.com through our partners at Toaster Lab, or on their respective Facebook pages for the ADC or Toaster Lab. Regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page as the video is the chat function in the top right-hand corner of your screen right here. Um, if you click this here, then you can type any questions you have into the chat at any time throughout the presentation, and I will read them out when we get to the Q&A portion of this session. If you have any technical difficulties at any point in the session, please send an email to levelup@designers.ca for immediate support. This event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. I will read aloud all questions we address from the chat, and this information will also appear visually at the bottom of your stream. Visual access is also supported with live captioning um, here at the bottom of the stream window of each presenter. If you require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or to provide much valued feedback following our events. If you enjoy this session, please consider donating any amount to the Associated Designers of Canada. This helps us support our National Arts Service Organization achieve its goals in the area of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Donation links will be available in the chat, and they're also available on screen in all viewing platforms, and I hope you'll consider donating uh, to support the ABC. Thank you. And thank you so much for your patience with our announcements. That's it for those. Um, today's event is Peer, Asserting Breath in Projection Content Creation and Playback Systems, uh, presented by Vladimiro Voino. We're really grateful to have Vlad with us today, and we're really excited to hear about this uh, work he did for his master's thesis. Uh, Vladimiro uses he, him pronouns and is a Colombian visual designer and technologist who aims to engage the sensory imagination through live performance. He is an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University School for the Contemporary Arts in Vancouver, Canada, and his work explores the adaptation of new technologies into the theatrical tradition. Interested in the development of theater spaces, show control, and sonography, he's an avid learner, constantly inventing and exploring. Thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation of uh, Vlad's master's thesis work, researching into the techniques and technologies of projection design and how they can help define motion and space in performance. Uh, I'm really excited about this presentation. I know we're going to get some really uh, interesting and valuable context from Vlad and hear about some really exciting work that he's that he's been doing. So um, without any further ado, uh, welcome Vlad. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, hello. Hi, Erin. How are you? I'm doing well. We're so grateful to have you here. Thanks for giving us some of your really valuable time. I know that uh, the screen time these days is precious, and so we're grateful that you're willing to share some of it with us. Totally. No, thank you for having me. It's very exciting to be a part of this um, symposium. I am uh, very humbled to have been asked to participate in this capacity. Of course. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm going to go through many different um, things that I've been kind of ruminating over the last 12 years um, as a projection designer and um, theater maker. Uh, I've got um, a bunch of different examples and different uh, images to look at. And um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll start to narrow down towards what I hope will be kind of um, 
I look into what was my master's thesis. Mm -hmm. I've got lots of media. <laughs> I, I maybe have an overwhelming amount of content, but uh, I'm excited to share. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm just gonna get going. Let's do um, it, thank you so much. Yeah, so like I said, I've been, um, like, I, I mean, you've mentioned I'm originally from um, Bogota, Colombia. Mm -hmm. I've lived in many places up and down the Americas. I've lived in San Jose, Costa Rica, Brooklyn, Connecticut, um, Florida, Wisconsin in the US, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, and in Canada, I've lived in Vancouver, Calgary, and Banff. Um, currently, I'm residing in Vancouver, BC, where I teach um, at Simon Fraser. Uh, and I've, it's in my, in my second year as a faculty member there. Um, I've been working in the theater since high school, uh, and my mom is a painter, uh, and her family is full of architects. Mm -hmm. My father is an industrial psychologist and uh, a human resources executive. Uh, uh, so you can say I'm like a, an artist that likes to work with people. Um, <laughs> you and, come by it honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Um, I'm going to begin by sharing a quote that I think kind of, uh, as I've gone through through the last, I think would say sort of 12, 12 to 15 years of, of theater, theater education and, and theater making, um, this quote I just keep going back to. And I actually found the original um, 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 a quote from, a, from my notebook and it's a quote from Paula Dunkirk, who's a dramaturg and producer of live radio and performance, a Foley artist and teacher in Canada. I think she's currently doing her PhD at uh, U of T. Mm -hmm. And it's from a reading, uh, and it was like, "What is it? What? What about? Uh, what is? What is theater? What is theater making about?" And 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 I and I this this quote has always struck me, and I actually get emotional every time I read it. Um, it is to engage the imagination in full dimension. It is an endeavor that includes all of the arts, music, dance, visual arts, and language. The purpose is to inspire argument and inquiry into the deepest concerns of humanity, such as equality, identity, responsibility, and love. To consider our own lives and our own world in new ways. To make theater is to create opportunity for a society to discuss its own orchestration. And. Uh, uh, to me, that 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 has always kind of inspired me, and and it sort of really embodies um, why I'm I'm interested in making theater and 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 participating with different collaborators. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go through and share with you sort of some of my thoughts, um, and through a series of projects that kind of share a, a, a series um, that share kind of uh, a unified thread. Um, Primarily, these are about process and iteration um, and sort of talking about in the way that us as designers make theater. I will try to articulate how I think through my work um, and, it, and it's con constantly living in, a, in tension between the kind of artistic and the technological. Um, ultimately, I'll, I'll have a look at kind of Peer, which is a very special project for me and was my master's thesis um, at the Yale School of Drama. Um, so here's just a, a short outline. I'm going to kind of talk through a bit of my background. We're going to look at many different projects in my past. We're going to look at kind of my source material, what the process was, and, and, and look into a little bit of, of what the performance itself was, some photographs. Um, some of the documentation and looking into the future as to what kind of comes next um, in terms of these kind of projects. Um, so this this was the poster from the original production. But I'm gonna uh, before we get to Pierre, um, which is what happened um, in 2018, uh, I want to kind of go way back um, and kind of get in get in touch with kind of my first contact with this kind of work. I had decided when I was I was finishing high school in Brazil that I wanted to study lighting design at UBC, and, and in 2007 I arrived in Vancouver. Um, and Robert Gardner was gearing up to remount the, the piece called Studies in Motion, which was an electric uh, company theater show that would eventually go on tour. It was uh, um, across Canada. It was directed by Kim Collier, 
um, with choreography by Crystal uh, Crystal Pite and the scenography by Robert Gardner, costumes by Mara Gottler, and uh, sound design by Patrick Penefather. Um, sitting in the sidelines and seeing this project go up like really opened my eyes to a whole bunch of concepts um, and staging ideas that I had never really seen before. Um, even though I had seen like some pretty wild stuff in Brazil um, and in Latin America, like this this stuff was pretty pretty new to me and pretty different. Um, this show was inspired by the 19th century photographer Edward Muybridge, um, who would kind of exhaustively photograph kind of anim animals and uh, humans in locomotion and sort of began to foretell the invention of modern cinema. Um, so one of my favorite parts in the show are sort of these de de deconstructions of, um, of, um, of, of movement um, and um and breaking them down kind of physically uh i'm gonna try to switch over to my slideshow here we go all right um so yeah so here's some images of the kind of the muy rich um photographs originally and and then one of the sequences that was so lovely which different people would move and, and deconstruct the motion of someone kind of picking up a newspaper. Um, what was also really interesting about this is that Robert was doing all of this um, as part of um, his um, in, uh, research, which was to look at projections as a source of illumination, not just as, as, as a source of um, image and image making. It was looking at space, it was looking at light, but kind of this kind of intersection between these two, um, and, and he always would refer to it as kind of painting with light, um, which I think it has, it still excites me as a concept, but um, at the time it was very complicated because there really wasn't kind of intuitive tools to approach that, especially with multiple outputs. Um, oops, yeah. And um, when I saw that, I decided that I kind of had to continue studying um, with Robert. Um, so through a series of productions at UBC, I was able to get access to some of research, some of Robert's research materials and his projectors and his computers. I learned Isadora, a software that Robert was using um, to, uh, to kind of approach this painting with light. Um, he would hang several projectors all over the stage, uh, some of them in lighting positions. So sometimes there would be front light, sometimes there would be uh, side light, top light, um, and as you saw in the Weebridge images, um, and maybe I'll go back really quickly to look at the first set, that they would use sort of scrims and um, uh, grids that would kind of help contextualize um, these spaces. So not only was he lighting the performers with the projectors, and, and I think in some of these instances, because the projectors weren't quite that bright yet, there might have been a, a little bit of lighting support um, from a side kit, um, but for the most part, um, the goal was to the aim was to try to light as most as many of the scenes with the projectors. Um, so I, I I kind of got caught up in this, and uh, under his mentorship, I kind of enlisted myself to one of the, my first large projects alongside um, MFA designer Mandy Lau, who was finishing her masters at UBC at the time. Um, and we worked with um, four projectors in the Telos studio, which is kind of a long, um, and I have a diagram here, um, kind of a very long and volumetric kind of tubular space. We hung uh, four projectors on high angles. And uh, the idea is that we would be able to sort of get coverage to be able to do some of the set pieces and set spaces, but also try to light um, some of the scenes. Again, with some success, I think ultimately, you know, in a way that projectors were maybe not bright enough at that time. I, you know, I, I've been experimenting a little bit more recently with brighter projectors and um, getting better results. Also, resolution was a big question. So this is kind of right at the edge, at the border of, of um, projectors going to uh, a higher resolution. Um, so we were still probably working with um, um, 1024 by 768 projectors, um, which which had these issues of like, you could see the grid of, of the projector lines on the performer's faces. Um, 
and perhaps yeah that, that the angles that we had set up were maybe a bit too steep um uh, but but really the um, there was some lessons i think out of this project um and and what was curious is that um mandy was working as the set designer i was working as the lighting designer together we were both working as projection designers on this piece um but we, we're kind of operating this four projector installation and it's all running through one computer <laughs> and and uh we're kind of running into a lot of process issues there's no way to kind of make um uh, be able to um how do you say um merge our visions um in a way that we could each work individually and then um unite kind of um the the programming so um what i've been doing is that I've, i'll start posting as part of some of these shows a little bit of some of the kind of like lessons that i've learned and things that i can share um that i've learned sort of the hard way um, and, and I think I'm always getting questions as to Vlad, how did you become a projection designer? How does one become a projection designer? And um, I think uh, I, I, I always struggle with that question because it just sort of happened so, so naturally. Um, so it's hard for me to say what the starting point was, but sort of, it was just sort of like um, getting to it on the first set of projects. And, and this was um, one of the big ones. Um, so a, a couple of lessons that I learned in this in this um, particular project is that only one person can realistically work on a computer at one time. Um, so one of the things for the future was, okay, we need to sort of separate, <laughs> um, you know, the different departments and their approach and potentially then figure out how to network them or, or then, sh or like everyone works independently and then you spend some time merging the, 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 the show file together. Um, you know, and that and that that we didn't really define a process and a procedure. So we were getting into tech, and I think there was a lot of a lot of um, struggle trying to figure out how do we make changes. Like we were able to program scenes, but by the time that we got into the theater, you know, and and the scene would change or the blocking would change, it would it would take hours to kind of try to um, find the little um, bits of programming that would allow. The, the the scenes to be lit in a particular way or to shift or if the set had to shift without the lighting there was kind of a, a, a yeah just a big separation between what was possible in terms of um both accessing the same system <laughs> so i think i think one of the big lessons there was to try to define the process and the procedure early enough and to sort of um test um elasticity and flexibility um with with the idea that you need to make changes in tech quickly, um, and uh, one of one of the tenets that I always keep in my mind as a projection designer is that I gotta work at least as fast as the lighting designer. Um, the lighting designer they they can only do so much work outside of the theater. They're going to be coming in with some level of preparation, and they're going to be um, creating a lot of the looks and cues on stage and during tech time, and that's the valuable time. So. We want to make sure that we're not eating up more time than they need um, as good collaborators. Uh, but yeah, so to consider how this process, how this thing that you're building to be able to accomplish the task is is able to kind of change quickly, is flexible, um, and, and is responsive in tech, right? And I think that's some of the questions that always come up in terms of making um, content for, for the theaters that we're, um, kind of in this tension between trying to make something that you can sort of um, uh, generate beforehand and bring in and, and kind of put it up and against whatever's happening on stage? Or is there something that you're kind of having pieces and you're bringing in um, and, and kind of assembling together with the technicians and the, and the other um, collaborators? Um, or is it something that is completely malleable and is sort of evolving as the tech is evolving, right? And we'll look at a bunch of different companies. And as, as you'll notice through these projects, I've been working primarily in a very contemporary idiom. And, and um, there is, I haven't done a lot of like classical pieces. I've been working mostly in new works. Um, I don't know why that is. It just sort of happened to me, uh, and so even all the way through UBC and 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 even later into my masters, I, I've been mostly working kind of with, with um, with new work. 
Um, um, I also want to um, add that like one of the things we hadn't accounted for is that um, every channel of projection that you add adds a significant amount of complexity to your project. So um, if you have, for example, a, a system that only has one channel of video is going to, um, you're, you're going to have, you, you have one space to focus on, you have one set of content to make and one set of content to queue. But once you start adding more channels, that, that kind of workload actually kind of increases exponentially and you find yourself <laughs> kind of cornered. Um, and at that time, there really wasn't a good way to preview like many outputs. Um, uh, and so it was, it, there was, it was difficult, but but I think, and I wish I had a good photograph of, of Robert's office at the time, because it was just like, there was like eight monitors hanging from the ceiling um, above his above his desk, kind of jerry-rigged um, with, with rope, just so that you could at least see what the content would look like before you plugged in the projectors um, uh, instead of uh, the monitors. Uh, so that was kind of a, an early way of previewing, but it was, it, exactly, it wasn't very intuitive. It required a lot of equipment, um, and it was certainly like very slow. Um, and so, in processes where you don't have a lot of time to create and a lot of time to kind of get into the guts of something, sometimes, yeah, simplifying, lowering the number of channels, or figuring out a, a methodology as to how you're going to actually edit and move and modify each of those channels um, independently and have their own timing is is um, is quite a challenge. Um, the next, I'll, I'll just show you this project. Um, Try Me Good King was a, a series of um, art song pieces. Um, they were produced by uh, Songfire Theater at UBC. Um, they had gotten a grant to kind of take these very um, um, kind of concert pieces that were normally performed um, in, a, in a concert hall with a piano uh and and give them scenography normally it was just kind of a singer in a, in a black dress next to a piano um, player um, and just very focused on the music this experiment um that was spearheaded by um tom schult professor tom schult at ubc was was given a grant to be able to to spend the summer kind of experimenting in the theater and like trying to make a mess with these um kind of small operas um and so this this i ended up working kind of entirely by myself so kind of maybe grown out of some of the other experiences where i was like well it's so complicated to try to do everything with multiple people in one system what if i just do everything myself um and so this this became a, a kind of interesting experiment. I had a couple of assistants, and some of the illustrations you see were done by a, Amanda Larder, who's a set designer in Vancouver. Um, and so I, I had some help, but overall, I just sort of lived in the theater for a month um, and assembled all the set pieces, rigged all the projectors, um, and set up my system um, as best as I could. Here you can see if I can get this to play. Let's try. This is uh, one of the set pieces I built for it, which was this kind of uh, pneumatic um, pneumatic bed that would kind of um, lift up uh, and reveal uh, King Henry VIII on his bed. And um, and it's it's the story sort of about King Henry VIII. He's on his deathbed, and and the different wives that he had um, that that he had killed come back and haunt him. Um, they, but ultimately, they're performed always by the same singer. So there was this kind of thing about trying to figure out how can we represent the different queens. And so there was there was something about the patterns that that they carried in their in their um, family crests. Um, and so I was working a lot with that with the set. And the idea is that they would go from the set onto the costumes themselves. Um, and so there was um, the singer would wear kind of a white dress. And this was sort of like in the middle of all the hype about kind of the early, like the first version of the Kinect. Um, I, I programmed sort of a live mask that would let me um, capture the outline of the performer. 
And then I would project sort of the patterns that were from out there. In this particular case, this queen had been um, decapitated. So there was something about like the blood flowing off of from the neck area. Um, it was um, it was a tough project. It, it, it required a lot of effort and, 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 it's, and, it, and I learned a few big important things. Um, number one, and it was it was a lot of uh, a big a big lesson to learn is that directors do change their minds and and visions do shift, um, and so one of the ma major things that I had spent a lot of time working on was trying to get this live mask thing with a connect working, uh, specific projectors, um, and with the with the idea that we would be sort of working all within one system, all unified, um, we would be doing lights and um, lights projections and some portion of the costume. Um, but but the, there was a lot of problems and, and glitches with the, the Kinect. And the, the night before the one performance we were doing, um, Tom decided that we, we should probably cut that effect. Um, and, and we kind of got into a, an argument about it. Uh, I really felt strongly that we had spent all this effort and that was kind of the point of this experiment was to try um, but um, but he felt really differently. He was trying to to kind of continue investing in this um, research, uh, so he was he was looking for success, uh, and so he he wanted to cut the effect. I had to accept that, and it was hard. It was one of those big design lessons where you have to say, "Wow, well, I I can't have everything. I have to be able to let go of my um, my precious ideas." Um, it regardless of how much work they are because we're kind of serving a, a bigger a bigger picture um, So directors change their minds. I, I will eventually forgive uh, Tom, but but uh, um, I think I think it was successful in many other ways uh, and um, Yeah, there, there was entirely lit scenes lit with projectors There was a, a, a huge aspect of it that I spent time learning about to sort of trigger um, multiple things out of one computer, um, but 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 also it was like too much. I had not slept in a month, uh, and I learned that you you just can't do everything by yourself. Um, you need to learn to collaborate. You need to learn to delegate. It is difficult, but um, it is completely unsustainable to try to do everything yourself. I I tried. Um, next, I'll show you quickly. Um, the thing of my existence, which was actually one of the first shows I sort of did as I was leaving university. Um, Thane Malabar wanted to create um, a piece about his life and he wanted to be able to tour it in his two-door car and he wanted to figure out a way to have it be deployable in a few hours and for someone that wasn't even, that even, didn't even know the show, be able to run it. Um, and so this experiment was about sort of creating a touring piece that would fit in, in his Tudor car. And I created this set that was made of out of kind of PVC pipe that just fit together with um, loose fittings. And it was three projectors, one rear and two side projectors, uh, as well as a couple lights um, for support. Excuse me. So you can see the kind of small diagram here first, and, and I'll show you a couple more photographs. Um, in this project, uh, we, I kind of learned that, okay, I need to be able to delegate, I need to be able to, to kind of hand off some of these tasks, and, and I kind of collaborated with a few other people um, in terms of the programming, in terms of, in terms of like kind of the content generation, but, uh, we did run into <laughs> some significant difficulties, um, and and those are some some big lessons to learn as well. That um, there's um, there's something about being able to get to separate and network your systems, but it takes a lot of time to do that, right? So you everyone like you have departments working independently, and then you want to merge that and be controlled through a primary central um, brain. Um, that takes a lot of time up front, and it and it you have to know when it's worth it. You have to know when you really need it. Um, I don't think necessarily your your average show in Vancouver that is not running for longer than a few weeks 
at most really wants to spend a lot of their valuable tech time trying to figure out complex show control. Um, in his case, it really made sense because he was looking for a piece that could tour, that could be um, essentially uh, travel in, in his car and be set up in an hour, and that just one person would be hitting the go button to trigger any of the sound accompaniment. So that was running all through QLab. QLab was triggering Isadora, which was running the, the video patch. Um, and um, QLab at that time didn't have the lighting component, so we were actually triggering from QLab to Isadora to run any um, the few DMX channels that we had for a couple of Fresnels. Um, the other thing I learned is that you know you can proof of concept this thing. Okay, I had these things triggering each other. That was looking really good. Um, it, Proof of concept does not carry the show. <laughs> you have to stress test, and with this we learned in a, in a in a in a tough situation. We had our first audience. Um, they had generously been uh, donating um, as part of as part of the performance, um, sort of a pay pay what you can situation, and uh, we were making changes right up until the last minute, um, and you know when you get to that place and you've made a bunch of changes and the audience comes in and you don't have a chance to run them or you've never run the show all the way through at least once um you're going to run into 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 unstoppable issues sometimes and you're going to you're going to have to do a show stop um and i and i think this was the first time that i was like well i'm just going to watch the show from the audience i'm going to let my peers run the show from the booth i'm just going to see and take notes I'll sit with the audience. I want to see how they're feeling. I want to. I want to kind of, in uh, kind of empathize with their experience. And <laughs> of course, the system because we had moved some cues around. The the cue counting had gone off, and so everything just kind of like grinded to a halt. The lights went out. We went dark, and he continued playing because he didn't really know what was going on. And and the audience was it was kind of awkward. Some audience members turned on their like cell phone flashlights. Um, it, it went on for a good five minutes before we someone in stage management called for a for a show stop and 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 just kind of tried to re reset. Um, for me, that was like the worst thing that could probably ever happen. But I'm I'm glad it happened then, I guess. Um, and you know, yes, don't. Make changes that don't get rehearsed, or you're 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 gambling with 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 potential um, show stops. But also the other thing I learned is that even in front of an audience, like a system crash is really not the end of the world. It sort of uh, actually makes the audience sort of empathize with you. And and then I've gone on to work with large companies that also just crash their shows because they're like trying to do something so complicated that like it's 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 always just on the edge of functional. Um, so so that was that was an interesting lesson and, and, and one that I always try to to share with my students and my peers is that sometimes it's okay for the thing to not work. I mean how else are you gonna figure it out? Um, so so that was that was interesting. Um, and a lot of lessons in that one tiny kind of one man show. Um, I think the next one, and I'm trying to skip over some, but but um, one of the other big ones that I spent a lot of time doing was this show called Sometimes Between Now and When the Sun Goes Supernova. And this one was um, performed at Theater Junction in Calgary. I had just moved there to become the, sort of the, the head of lighting um, department there um, after having gone on a small a um, series of dance tours um, with um, Kit Pivot and Crystal Pite. I, I kind of stumbled into this theater and they had invited me to kind of become part of their, their staff, but also part of their kind of creative team. Uh, and it was it was very complicated. It had a, um, a lot of inputs and outputs. Um, the projection surface was this massive sort of like 70 foot curved psych. Um, that required um, some complex geometry and edge blending. At the time, we didn't really quite have Mad Mapper uh, at a place where I felt it it satisfied uh, my needs. Isadora quite wasn't there yet, and so I was testing a lot of ideas, a lot of processes to try to get the look that we were um, getting to. Um, and so, what? What I ended up using was sort of like going from Isadora into this software called Mapio, um, 
which is a um, pretty fantastic little application. I believe it's still sort of running. It's sort of standalone, or it can become its own media server at this point. Um, but at the time, it could do some really beautiful um, edge blending and and uh, and warping. Um, uh, this show, yeah, it was a, an exercise in like durational creation. Um, we did several residencies for this project. Um, it was bilingual. It was in both in, in French and in English. We, we had subtitles kind of being um, possibly being able to run both ways. Uh, but uh, I think one of the one of the major things that I learned, and, I, and I've learned this kind of throughout several shows, um, um, there's there's a couple things. Number number one, I, f I find that um, dynamic subtitles um, that sort of account for composition and space can really um, add to your like visual aesthetic. Um, so if there's a way for you to place the subtitles sort of um, in relationship or in composition with everything, it's a little bit less distracting than having them be sub or 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 above. Um, this this was the first process where I really felt like I had a, a voice in kind of throwing out ideas um, for the for the creation of the company. Um, they kind of operated it uh, as a um, company of artists. Um, so there was there was a little bit of input and ideas and things that I could try and a lot of room to 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 go. Um, but I also learned that you have to sort of articulate how long you think things are going to take. I didn't really know how to. Um, you know, edge blend on a curve, you know, these three projectors, it was actually quite complicated and I didn't really know how to communicate. Well, it's gonna probably take a week, but I just kept saying, oh, it'll just be a moment. And I think that kind of created a lot of tension. Um, so sometimes just taking stock of how long you think things will take, I think is, is a significant and important thing to take, take care of. Um, with your collaborators and, and respecting their time and, and maybe and that there is positive ways for them to use that time if, if they're just waiting for you because they think it's two minutes um, then then um, they won't be accomplishing anything else but if you say look it's gonna take me an entire day or a couple of days they can kind of go ahead and do something else um, one of the other major things with this project, and, and, and it was also happening with a few other projects at the time, is that you, you need to try to leave things in a state where you're not the only person that knows how to realistically set it up. This was so complicated <laughs> that I, I doubt that without at least myself and, and, and Phil Chimolai at the, at the time, who, who was the sound um, designer and, and engineer, without us, I don't think anyone could probably set up that system again. Um, it was it was very convoluted. It was very complicated. It did a lot. Um, it was very powerful, but but we didn't we didn't um, have a way to kind of document it so that it could be handed off to anyone um, in the future. So I guess one of the one of the ideas here is just leave breadcrumbs for yourself. Um, um, and another one, and I kind of pass this on from a different project to this to this list, but but it's also relevant in here because and I think this is the first time that I had worked with a high level. A filmmaker is that um, content is king, um, and it's it's uh, something a, a professor at, at Yale would also say um, is the, is um, David Biedney that content is king. You know, like all of these these gadgets, all of these projectors, all of this stuff is 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 it's um it's sweet and fun to play with, but like it can take it so much further if you have some quality content. And in this case, we had some incredible. Um, footage that had been shot in different cities and the forest. Um, you know, someone that actually had a background in commercial uh, cinematography was like really opened up my mind to working beyond just like whatever I can just produce in Photoshop or in After Effects quickly. Um, so that there's something about working with a specialist that can really um, improve your content. Um, and the other thing here is that technical residencies are super, super, super invaluable. Like they're they're really important to to be able to make kind of complex work, um, and and uh, I do I have worked on all sorts of residencies and I've seen people come in all levels of preparation, but but uh, it's it's very special time and so all I urge everyone is to kind of come really prepared and and with a lot of things to jam with right like not necessarily finish things but come come prepared with with um, different pieces and bits that you can kind of play with um, next I, I want to just look at um, the last 
uh, Voyage of Donald Crowhurst, which um, was a production done by Ghost River Theater and Alberta Theater Projects. Um, it was uh, an incredible experience. <laughs> I don't, I, I really think it was one of the best uh, shows still in my books that I've ever worked on. Um, it was um, massive in so many ways. Um, but I think the most exciting thing about it was that we tech this show in uh, Calgary over the course of sort of six months. And we had um, sort of like three almost month long uh, residencies, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, there was there was a lot of time where we could sort of experiment together and and essentially um, try things out, but not just on paper. We could actually we actually had we were actually working in a black box with a mock up of the set, with a mock up of all the projectors in place, um, and kind of giving um, that ability to the entire team to play with with some of these tools. Um, so I'm just gonna play this little. Um, clip here, which is sort of the trailer. So you kind of get an idea and um, and I can talk a little bit more after. Oops. All right, I, I hear that it's maybe very quiet. Uh, let me try that one more time. Uh, Aaron, can you tell me if, if you're hearing it now? Oh, not yet. We can see it very clearly, though. Yeah. Um, let me just see if I can quickly. Make this work. Let's try that. How about now? Nope, we're not hearing it yet. Uh, okay. But speaking of sound, this was Matt Waddell, I believe, who worked with you on this project. Is that right, Vlad? Or, totally, and, and Laura and Sola as well. Um, this was a, just yeah, a massive, massive production. Had so many different interesting um, aspects and, and yeah I'll, I'll get into it in a second let me just see if i can somehow get sound in there yeah just while you're troubleshooting about that i can share a little bit with our um attendees matt waddell did our very first presentation in the whole symposium so if you want to check out a presentation from him about how to um, create custom tools for projected media and sound specifically in the theater. Um, that was a really interesting presentation that he gave at the very beginning of the symposium. And it's available on our site now in the archive. Um, and uh, Matt Waddell is also the person who taught me how to use QLab when I was first working also with Ghost River uh, right out of school back in 2012. So there's a bit of a personal connection for me there too. And so it's really exciting to uh, for us to hear a little bit and see some examples here from Donald Crowhurst. It was a really incredible project that they did. And I'm so grateful that Vlad's sharing it with us. Yeah, I don't know if I can get the sound. Can you hear I think, it? I think even just to watch the video is very yeah. valuable, Vlad, yeah. yeah. And we'll find the link. I know this uh, video is also available on the Ghost River website. Yeah. So I'll find the link and we can post it for people to watch afterwards. Um, but if you wanna show the video now and, and maybe talk over it and tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're sharing with us, that would be great too. Yeah. One second. <laughs> now I've done something funny with this, unfortunately. Okay, sorry. It was now monitoring into my audio, but here, yeah, I'll continue now. Now that I can kind of talk over it, um, what you'll see is that we kind of were working with the idea of um, as what what I started to call essentially um, video foley. Um, and so what you'll see is moments like this, for example, where um, Donald Crowhurst is about to go onto his um, 
solo circumnavigation voyage around the world in a boat. And it's the last night that he has with his wife. Um, and he's going to leave for months on this on this voyage that that is quite dangerous. Um, so there's kind of this void between them. But we kind of did a live composition with two cameras that joined their feeds um, up above. And you know we had a bit of a soft edge. And and so suddenly you could actually get both both performers in the composition, but also below it you would see um, kind of their separate. Um, situations and, and their feelings and, and we had a couple different things like someone would come up with a sleeve um, um, like similar to his pajamas and and as he reached out would sort of um, touch her on the shoulder um, so yeah we had qu quite a few elements the 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 back wall um, was a curved psych that would fly in and out. It was four projectors edge blended onto it to get the brightness um, to punch through the lighting as much as we could. Um, and as well, there was sort of a television, four cameras. It was the first time, yeah, that that with Matt Waddell, um, we were working with um, really like, you know, HD 60 frames per second, um, live feed content that was, you know, at, at the time, as good as it was going to get in terms of lip sync quality so that we can actually see faces. I think they had done some workshops before me um, where um, that where they couldn't um, really show faces because, you know, the, the out of sync nature of, of um, the video would would um, would be too distracting. Um, so that was definitely a, an incredible uh, opportunity and i think it really opened my mind up to this idea that um we need to be making our own tools um i had been sort of frustrated with um the tools that i had uh, at my disposal to be able to do live feed a lot of it had to do with sort of like analog video cameras that if you would put them in comparison to some render content would feel really low quality and it was always out of sync um, and so the discovery in here is that we had sort of um, as a demo because I think they had tried in workshops before I got on the project that they had tried watch out and they had tried Isadora they had tried um, I don't know if QLab yet had video for that capacity but they had tried a few things and um, what we did in this in this project is we we kind of got it our, our, we had never really messed with it too much. We got really involved with with Touch Designer, and we had the time to sort of explore and develop how we were working. Um, and we did, developed a bunch of different queuing systems. Uh, we started out with spreadsheets, and then it moved on to um, um, spreadsheets that were sort of dynamic. And then we kind of moved away from spreadsheets entirely that were being referred to in terms of like calling and and uh, loading and offloading media. Um, it was it was a lengthy trial and error process, but um, it really gave me the time and, and and space to kind of imagine what is what what is it that we can do with these these ideas and the fact that we could actually have them in the rehearsal room made a significant difference to the process and to the content at the end. Um, so yeah, so here's some photographs and and you can imagine here, for example, in this composition, we had sort of like a this is the top of show and there's sort of like a Brady Bunch um, movement of the of the images, right? And so there's Donald Crowhurst who's in the center. Um, we have his wife uh, on the left and sort of his manager or or sort of producer in the back, right? And we have three well, we you know we had these characters that we were we were calling the documentarians um, and they were sort of, representative of the media at the time. Um, you know, this this being a true story was all about um, how things were being represented um, to the audience that was following the story of this race. Um, so so we have this kind of yeah interesting set of compositions that where you see kind of a cinematic experience and and the, the thing below is, so, you know, some people might call this uh, expanded cinema. Um, um, or yeah, or stage cinema. I think I think that is you know, or staging live cinema. I've, I've heard a bunch of different terms, but anyway, it was very fun, and the fact that we could do it at a high resolution and and with um, low latency made it kind of possible to really play with some ideas. But again, not having had like the cameras and all of this gear 
essentially throughout the rehearsal process, we wouldn't have gotten to these compositions um, because they really depended on the technology to, to happen. We were also playing with, for example, live green screen um, keying out. And, you know, there was a whole sequence where um, this announcer is um, essentially showing the path of the race and how much, um, you know, there, there was a lot of Im important details that had to be kind of illustrated. And so we were using different um, devices like this to, to kind of get to that point. And all of these setups would happen very quickly. There was like a lot of moving scenery, a lot of everything was on wheels. Um, these flats can kind of roll away. The screen could fly out. Um, we had um, uh, just such a, a variety of, of methods to, to explore things. And we had these sort of like um, prop tables that um, would sort of be live film that would kind of get give us um, some of his actions really up close. Um, and sort of like what I had mentioned with, with this one earlier during the video, um, that kind of that kind of live composition um, that the camera is showing you something, but but on stage you're seeing something else, and all together it's sort of a third image. So there's this kind of, um, you know, meaning making that the audience is making. They, the, the audience has to be then smart enough to sort of um, decide what they're looking at, you know, and what to focus on. And everyone's going to have a slightly different experience too, right? Depending on what you're looking at and what in what portion of the production. Um, so just yeah, so quickly. Um, some some things that I learned out of that is that you know um, what well, we had we had a lot of time and we were trying sometimes to like imagine an idea and then just like try it out and we would spend a lot of time developing that um, uh, and then um, and then we started to kind of um, really explore um, recording just jam sessions and just like trying out. And this is sort of like how one of the big sequences was built is that we would kind of create this um, thing where you could kind of explore um, um, a series of, 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 of jams and then sort of document that and film it and then sort of cherry pick it um, and see what would stick. Um, I think, yeah, bringing tech into rehearsal is really important um, and, and to allow yourself to play in the process like I was because I, I actually, for the first time, had a team in this project. Um, I had uh, Lara as an associate and, uh, in, in projections, and, and Matthew was the sound designer, but was also programming with me, that we could sort of step away from the computer. And that's also massive, like being able to kind of interface with, with your team, working with a team. Um, and, and, you know, in, pro in projection, we struggle a lot with kind of working by ourselves and having to field every department all by ourselves. We need to start arguing that just like other departments, we need our own people too. Um, I think that's that's important. Um, and the, another thing we learned, I think, on this project, and I think Matthew mentioned that in his in his talk as well, is that Mac hardware is like really expensive <laughs> for certain tasks. Um, to not be a loyalist, you know, if if a PC is going to work better and you're going to get a lot more mileage that way, you know, don't be afraid. Build a computer, do the research, um, try it out. I, I personally um, go both between Mac, PC, and I and I'm actually doing a lot of exploration right now in Linux as well. Um, all right, so, uh, but yeah. What, what do you think, uh, Aaron, in terms of these some of these ideas and concepts in trying to um, bring tech into rehearsal and and uh, how that changes your process? Yeah, I think it's wonderful for us to talk about because it's really interesting in this festival or this symposium, I should say, you know, it's really the dramaturgy of design. It's not just about tech, right? And, and you've really highlighted that in the projects that you've shown that each of these projects that you chose to demonstrate give examples of projects where the projection modality, the way in which storytelling is happening, is central to the way the story is communicated. There is no sort of, um, I think this is something I really admire about your work, is there's no sort of decorative backdrop. This is all integral to the function of the storytelling. And that if you remove projection from these stories, the stories 
themselves do not make sense in the same way. And so I think something like that idea of live video folly that you talk about, that integration of being able to see the way the shot is taken and then also being able to see the composite image at the end, that this kind of thing is, is it creates a real sensation of liveness, a real sensation of truth for the audience is another word some of us use at times. Um, and, and that really creates something very special and tangible in the space that you can't sort of get otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even going back to the very first project that you you listed as one of your big inspirations for your studying, Studies in Motion, this is a project which also completely changed my life. I saw it when they toured it to Calgary um, over my winter break from university. And and I it was the first project I think I had seen in Canada that really made me feel like they're actually telling a story with this tool. Yeah. It's not just something where they, you know, hired their graphic designer to make some fancy motion graphics along the, you know, backdrop. It's not distracting me from an opera. Mm -hmm. It's not pulling my focus from something that's happening on stage. It is the point. It's the mode in which I'm being communicated with. Totally. And you really have highlighted that in every single one of these projects that as the tech has advanced, you know, you have not been working in service to the technology that you have been customizing, building and, you know, recruiting team members who can help you make magic. And I think that yeah. that is something that, is sort of irreplaceable, you know, that mm -hmm. that attitude of artistic discovery and pushing the boundaries. Um, and we've seen this even in COVID, just with what you've been sharing on social media and the work that you've been doing as an artist, you know, since the, the theater is shuttered and some of the different things that you've been inspired by. Yeah. Um, and so I think that spirit is really what uh, we're trying to bring out in each of these talks. And, and I think you've highlighted it really effectively. So, and it's wonderful to see a bit of that history because, uh, you know, I was just, um, sort of messaging offline with our tech support, Emily, that, you know, it, it, looking back, you were talking about um, your project you did at the Grand about how, oh, no one could ever put this system together except for us now. Um, and of course, there's ways of documenting anything. But in that sort of 2012 to 2015 era, when we were all creating work, the composite tools that we have now, were, you know, things like QLab, like QLab didn't yeah. have any mapping at that time. No, you know, know, like yeah. these tools where, you know, you we have tools now where you could just do an entire show in one software. You don't yeah. have to, but it's possible. At that time, even someone like me who is not a technologist was, you know, writing my own code, desperately searching through the bowels of the artistic internet yeah, for like yeah. other people who had created solutions. We that idea of sort of making it up yourself wasn't an option. It was the only way forward. Exactly. Exactly. And it's so different than now. It's it's almost it's easy to sort of have um, you know, memory loss about it uh, yeah. when we look back at these projects. Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm gonna show one more thing and, and I'm and I'm curious to see um, what you think because I, I don't know I think we, we we had met a little bit sort of in between while I was doing all of these these mm -hmm. things with with um, the companies in New York um, so I'm just gonna do kind of one last quick um, project because I think it's significant uh, or or just kind of this period of time that I spent um, in New York this was um, working with the the Wooster Group um, I was kind of halfway through. And my, my degree and a job posting came up. They were looking for someone to kind of take over the the the, the kind of the projection department from someone that was had, had kind of done their five years and were looking to kind of move on. Um, and so I kind of was kind of overlap with with um, that person with uh, Bob Woods, um, who's who's a good friend of mine, and and we. Um, yeah, he was kind of showing me how they work. And it's a company that's been around for a long time. And they've kind of like just gathered so much equipment from so many different eras. And there's just so many layers. Um, and it's complex. Um, and like you say, that there's something about the integral nature of the video in this company um, that um, really opened my mind to uh, like another another step further into this idea of of, of tool making of, of developing the process myself and and trying to figure out something that works um, uh, to to um, yeah to just increase the the ability to experiment and I think it was sort of similar to what I was doing with the Ghost River, but this was kind of even even more more intense. So these are just some photos from when I started um, there in in, uh, in in New York. I'm gonna skip this one actually just for the sake of time. But I want to show you a little clip just just from a, it's a time lapse I took because it it sort of shows you that there isn't necessarily like a 
a very specific process for creation with them. They just sort of take up, you know, between six months and two years to develop a piece. And then the rest of the time, um, they're touring, right? So the Worcester Group is a company of artists. They may work for theater, um, dance, and media. Uh, they're, they're based sort of in, in, in Soho, uh, in, the, in the performing garage, which you saw in the first photographs. Um, and um, I'm going to just show you a little clip of, of kind of how the kind of aesthetic design of the space just kind of gets built up over time. Uh, there isn't like, a moment where we like read the play and make a drawing and do some research and output a set design. Actually, this just happens very organically over a long period of time. So I'm just gonna play this a bit of this clip for you. Unfortunately, you probably can't hear it, but it, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, you kind of get the idea visually, and so I'll just talk over it. I'll just kill, kill the sound. Um, <clears throat> so. What you're seeing here is the, the performance garage, which is um, this um, old tiny little theater. It's wonderfully rich um, with history of many, many works that the, this group has put on together, um, with many of the company members um, kind of being there for quite a long time. Um, as you can see in this um, series of, of images, you'll see that there's like a lot of little monitors that are playing things. And actually, there's a whole set of videos that the audience can't see um, that is playing that is kind of part, is, is part of the acting method. Um, and it's it's sort of about kind of letting go of ego, always being connected to the source material. And essentially, I would call it, um, uh, you know, this is my interpretation of, of what it is, um, that it's sort of like a visual score that carries the piece and that what they're watching on those monitors for the performers might be uh, movies of dance, it might be uh, an old video of documentation from the company from a different show, uh, it might be video of the rehearsal that we were just in yesterday, you know, we, we call an accident tape, um, that there's this kind of, um, exploration of, 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 of the source material beyond just text. So there's a lot of, they, they, they gather a lot of different materials. Sometimes it's text, sometimes it's movies. They draw a lot from movies. One of the shows that I toured extensively was the Town Hall Affair, which is based on a film by, by Chris Hedges and Dave Pennebaker. Um, uh, you know, so there's, there's, um, there's kind of a, a broader view of what your source material can be. And it, it really inspired me to kind of potentially connect with something. I was, I was looking for what to do for my thesis project. I didn't want to do a paper project. I was interested in devising something. And so um, this, 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 this watching the way that they worked really kind of inspired me to kind of move into um, kind of diving into uh, alternative um, source materials and, and, and how you kind of play with um, video as a, as a way to kind of um, manipulate the scene in terms of things that the audience can see and not see. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna move up ahead. I'll just show you. Uh, so this, you know, when I when I got there, they, they tour a lot and so it's a lot of stuff. They're big systems, there's a lot of monitors. Um, you know, a lot of this had to do with like, how do I get some of these system, like what you see on the right here, um, that was the system um, that was running a town hall affair and it would tour all over the world. And it's, it was very complicated. It was kind of part analog, part digital um, distribution because you have to get things to like almost 16 different channels of video um, so that the performers can have multiple multiple different channels of video that they're seeing. And they, they also have that routed to their ear. Um, and you know, there, there's, a lot of variables at play <laughs> and it's hard to track. And then because of it works kind of through accumulation, um, sometimes it's hard to kind of update things. And, and here, one of the things that was happening is that some of the equipment was starting to, to kick the bucket like it couldn't no longer hold, but the show was still touring. And so how do you take something that's already there and kind of uh, update it? Um, so th that's sort of one of the one of the major things that I participated in was sort of the kind of rebuilding, reorganizing of of these systems, and it it made me just think about um, um, the way that we queue systems and the way that we build systems. You know, this is sort of what the the diagram originally looked like um, when I arrived, and and trying to then use this to kind of figure out how do we modernize this, right? Like it's 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 it it still needs to tour. We want to kind of 
maintain the integrity of, of the artistic vision originally. Um, and there was it was a lot of work to try to kind of um, expand into um, um, what you know con the contemporary technology can accomplish. Um, and so part of that was like imagining and dreaming how these systems work and how how that data needs to move. And it, so it involves a little bit of visioning of, as to how the patches are functioning together and how they kind of move through through a system. Um, I'm going to move through this a, a little bit quickly, but if anyone uh, wants to ask questions later um, via email, um, you'll be able to get my contact through the through the symposium. But you know, this is, for example, what it uh, the, the the kind of current system is looking like. Um, you know, it's working digitally. It's working through you know HDSDI. In this particular drawing, the data is going from the bottom um, parts, which are like the computers, the sources, routing through a switcher, uh, a digital switcher, and sending to um, um, the, the monitors via 3G HDSDI, which lets you kind of go further, right? We don't have the limitations of, of um, HDMI. Um, you know, so you can see the level of complexity that is involved in these video systems, and the majority of the things that are running the show and the show can't even rehearse without this functioning is um is complicated and and um yeah there's there's an essential quality to it without it this the systems don't work so there's some photos of building rebuilding the machines and and trying to rack mount them and, and make them tourable that was another big um thing that kind of um got me going and uh, sort of building building systems that were that were kind of in one piece so that when you arrive at a venue, you just open it up and plug it all in. Um, there you go. So again, I talked a little bit um, in, in the introduction and, and essentially in the title of this talk <clears throat> that I'm, I'm looking to, to talk about breath. Breath, um, I think generally being the find as, you know, um, something that's taken into or expelled from the lungs an inhalation or exhalation of air from the lungs, you know, a brief moment, the time required from what, for one act of respiration, you know, the power of, of breathing life. Um, and, and how do we kind of achieve that in, in the systems that we're working with and the tools that we're using to create content? Um, so for me, it's, it's breath. I'm, I, I, I'm referring to it in the sense of like how a live performance changes moment to moment. It's different every night. It might evolve over the course of the run of the show. It might change. It might shift. Um, and how do we refine our tools to do that and, and to kind of engage with content generation and manipulation um, so they can grow and evolve with the process of making, but also like how does that work with the process of performing? Like, can that in its, in and of itself, can the creation of content be um, essentially the, the performance itself? Um, and, and how do we think about these systems so they have and they maintain expandability, elasticity, flexibility, and of course, repeatability. Like, can you kind of perform this without it, like having to show stop and, and uh, um, not go anywhere? Um, so I really struggled for a long time trying to find source material. Um, I wanted to do, I wanted to play with time. I wanted to play with sampling. I wanted to play with looping. Uh, I was looking for a story about time travel and I looked at a lot of movies and a lot of books and I read a lot of uh, different ideas, but, but sort of where I settled was actually <clears throat> this book, this, um, short film or feature or fictional kind of featurette, uh, directed by Chris Marker, who's a French, um, uh, filmmaker and artist uh, from um, who, who lives sort of between 1921 and 2012, but but uh, one of the things that he's most famous for is La Jete, and then this film called A Green Without a Cat, um, and a documentary called Sans Soleil that he sort of shot almost simultaneously as La Jete, which was actually released in '62. Um, sort of part of this French new wave uh, of cinema that occurred in the '50s and '60s. Um, you know, some of his uh, collaborators called him the kind of prototype of the 21st century man. Um, and the story sort of tells of a post-nuclear uh, war experiment in time travel. Um, and it's essentially uh, told through a series of photographs of stills um, and essentially a photomontage um, that, that kind of lasts different lengths. 
uh, and there's a, a little bit of narration and, and sound effects, but it's kind of minimalist in, in a sense, and, and the aesthetic is, is in black and white, um, and it's and it's paced um, um, very carefully. Um, so in the film, kind of a survivor of the futuristic Third World War is obsessed with um, uh, the kind of uh, distant and disconnected memories of of a, of a sort of thing that maybe he remembers that happened at, at um, Orle Airport, at the pier, um, or the GT, um, and um, which are kind of these images of, of a mysterious woman and a man's death, you know, um, in, in short, what happens is the, the sort of um, scientists that are trying to find a solution for their, um, the fact that there is no future, essentially, um, choose him to to travel through time to seek for help um they seek for help in the future and and it's of no use and then they send him to the past to try to see what he can discover um or actually yeah we, we go we go to the past first to see if we can actually do this and then move to, to try to get help from the future um everything is again it's told through, through these kind of still images except for one very particular shot um uh, of, of, a, of a woman that's sleeping suddenly waking up and it's kind of this climax um, and it's it's kind of moving after experiencing this kind of 20 minutes of, of um, very kind of um, paced imagery. Um, so I, I just want to show you just a little bit of, of, of what that uh, looks like. Of course, I don't know if the sound is working, unfortunately, but um, I'll just show you a little bit of the montage. And so there's 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 still photographs. There is sometimes movement. There is sometimes um, shifts in what's happening. Um, but let me just there's there's brief introduction. But it's really it's just essentially a, a voiceover with um, with kind of told through images. But of course the the images are being filmed, so they they are kind of moving in this in this kind of very slight textural way. Um, so there's sort of the montage of the end of the world. Um, the the fact that in this story, and you can you can find it pretty easily online, it's it's kind of everywhere and it, it has inspired other works that you know the film Twelve Monkeys is sort of based on this on this story as well. Um, there's there's kind of multiple timelines at play, and that all, that kind of really excited me. And this kind of very, very kind of defined aesthetic um, of the photo montage kind of um, called me a little bit, and I was curious. Okay, how can I um, start to to play with this idea and maybe potentially deconstruct this into a performance? Um, so I'm just going to move ahead into a little bit of um, sort of the staging of it and, and kind of how I was arriving at kind of the, the setup that I will show you in, in some photographs and, and in a bit of video. Um, but we were working this kind of small experimental theater. The idea that I would kind of gather a team of, of collaborators. Um, I was leading this project as sort of like the lead instigator of, of, of the idea, but I, I brought on a lot of people that helped me. Um, there's uh, Jekamai Vaness, who, who was kind of a directing collaborator, um, and Caitlin Voss was a producer. Um, I had Jonathan Thompson helping me code all of this together. He was working at, at Yale on a different project with me, trying to get the, the Yale Repertory Theater to use Touch Designer for the first time. And so we had just built a giant media server for this kind of um, much larger project, and he stayed on to really make a humongous difference in, in being able to, to code um, the level of complexity that this piece had, um, as well as uh, Frederick Kennedy, who did the sound design, um, Daphne, who I, I, I was seeing, who did the lighting design, and um, Michael Commendatore, who was kind of a, a video projection collaborator and performer. Um, Cole McCarty did the costumes. Um, and then I had a, a team of, of uh, technical directors including uh, Latiana Gursong and um, or LT and Ben Jones and um, 
and yeah, we would we would kind of have we, we had I had a significant <laughs> group of people kind of jumping onto this project, which is one of the amazing things about Yale is that you have you're surrounded by people that are just craving to make stuff all the time, and everyone's just so generative in this period that that um every all these people jumped on. Um, I did a translation of the text. Originally, it was in French. I, I, I was, I thought for a while of trying to, and I recorded a version with Ari Rodriguez in, in, in French. But ultimately, I moved it to English. And um, one of actually one of my lovely instructors from, from Yale, who, who taught um, um, uh, visual uh, imaging and and technology, David Bierney, did the voiceover for the piece. Um, uh, so I, again, I had this army of people um, kind of helping me put this together, uh, and we, we really had a great time. Um, uh, it was we sort of storyboarded out the moments. We had the voiceover, but then it was about devising how to set up all of the different shots um, as an experience. Essentially, what happens, and I'll just hit play and try to mute this here so that I can hear myself is that um, for the first sort of 15 minutes as the audience is coming in, what, what the setup was is that you would essentially watch us um, kind of teeter around with all of this equipment, right? There's um, all of the engineers, technicians, and performers are all on stage. We're all sitting behind the, uh, one screen. Um, and, and the idea was that we would start to sample um, content, right, and kind of build up the images for this piece as the audience is coming in, um, and sort of to create sort of a library of, of of images. Some of that was even including the audience at the beginning. We would kind of dress them up and and photograph them, um, but but the audience doesn't really know what's happening at the beginning. It's it's unclear what these what these um, people in costume are doing. Um, you know, I, every time I would kind of uh, hit something that was um, that was good. I would I would call for Mark, and everyone would know that that was that means that the image was recorded. Um, and I also had um, a series of monitors on stage that would instruct or tell the the team which which take we were in and what camera it was using. Um, this system was um, programmed in, in entirely in, in Touch Designer, and uh, we had. Essentially, uh, six cameras. Uh, so some of them were on sliders or as a tabletop camera. There was some that would just run around with a long cable. Um, they were there were different setups and different takes. But essentially, as you're coming in, you're just kind of watching the lights turning on and off. Um, Fred would be playing um, kind of a live composition um, on his keyboard and with his laptop, and we just start to kind of um, um begin to um, um collect all of this this imagery um eventually after about 15 minutes and we have a, we had a lot of uh, small parts and things and maquettes um as well um, um i'm gonna get to the part so what what happens next essentially is that um once we run out of time. Sort of about the 15 minute mark. We would start to play back the images on the downstage screen. And so you sort of get to see um, the present um, past on the screen. And through the screen, you see. Um, Essentially, the the um, the future, right, of of the future actions that are being recorded, just that they're ha sort of happening nonsensically, so you, they don't really make any sense, right? Which is sort of what happens in the film. And we're kind of recording all these sequences with these things. In essence, the system was like if you can imagine uh, a um, um sort of like a movie editor um, um like premiere right you're gonna have a timeline you lay out you have a, a media bin 
full of clips, you drag them into the timeline and you edit them together. For us, what we would do though, was that at the end of every night, we would keep the edit of, of, of how we had refined it or maybe touched it up. But the thing that we didn't, that we didn't keep was any of the media. So at the end of every night, at the end of every performance, we would take the media bin and delete it. So every night, and it just became sort of like this live video game where you're trying to collect as many of the images as possible before the playback catches up with you. Um, I'm just gonna try to find that before my time is up here. Yeah, so the images start playing back, sort of telling you the, and some of that was photographs, some of that was composites of, of a camera pointing straight down at a table with a green screen image, um, sort of like this one, this one image, right? That's Marky has been recorded sort of in the green screen, but compo composited with a, a photograph. At this, at this time also, we're kind of getting the, the monologue, but while that's happening and the audience is watching that, we're rushing to continue to film ahead. Of course, eventually the video playback is gonna catch up with us, right? So there's like a, the playhead that's chasing us and we're recording ahead simultaneously. Um, and so what happens eventually is that the, the, the 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 playback catches up with us and the only thing that's left to do is to go entirely live and so we shift from this kind of um storytelling that's very slow and photographic and sort of like in the movie we take a, a, a pivot into motion and into um a, a different um mode right um Uh, still, but you can't hear the audio, but I'll try to post uh, a way for you to see it um, in its entirety uh, with the sound, if you're interested. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead. To where we go live. And then we can wrap that up. But maybe I'll just leave it running and um, Aaron, if, if, if I don't know, I, I know that I'm, I'm uh, running out of time here, but I don't know if there was any yeah. questions or, or anything that you, um, you had seen on the chats. Um, it's so great to see this project, Vlad. Uh, I think if anyone has a question, they can throw it in the chat now. We'll just have another couple of minutes to respond to any questions that come up. Um, but also, of course, people can email uh, levelupatdesigners.ca if you have questions, and we'll pass them on to Vlad as well. Uh, you can, we've also posted, Vlad, your website there, and uh, we'll post your Instagram as well, so if people want to get a hold of you through those streams, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah. Great. That's perfect. Um, I wanted to just say, in response to this wonderful project you're sharing with us, um, how exciting it is to see a project where the actual process of creation on a technical side is visible to the audience. And I think that that influence from your Wooster group, um, the learning you did working in that capacity is really evident here. And it's really thrilling to see that you went, you know, sort of talking about these early projects where it's you by yourself with no sleep for a week to a project like this, where you're working with a whole team of creators yeah. with who can no really sleep see for the vision. Yes, with no sleep for a week, um, <laughs> but who can really see the vision and that you're all working together towards that same vision. Um, I think that's a really exciting uh, template and possibility for us. It's a framework that we're not seeing very much in contemporary creation uh, yet in, in many of our companies. And so this idea that, that we can have a, you know, our visual work um, and have a, sort of a dramaturgical, almost like leadership that it's sort of taking the lead, it's taking the primary role in terms of communicating with the audience and not um, sort of discounting how powerful that is. And I think that you gave us a great timeline here of projects, which really mm -hmm. built towards the success of this, of this thesis. I'm so grateful that you shared this with us. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. 
Um, it's also just really amazing to see this idea of, uh, you know, taking some influence from something from, you know, the 1970s and then applying our contemporary media and our contemporary practices to it in such a successful way. I think it's really wonderful. I, I know that me and many of my projection design colleagues work a lot with this sort of micro macro, um, you know, close up and live scale and manipulating scale. And we can see that in your image here with the, the close up of the maquette yeah, overlaid yeah. with the, the live human scale. And the real um you know the simplicity like i think in theater of course we all say kiss keep it keep it simple stupid um you know obviously this is an incredibly complex system you've designed but that visually and dramaturgically the the concepts are very simple for the audience to take in and so you've taken something incredibly sophisticated and really um distilled it and really um you know got the essence out of it which i think is something that's incredibly valuable for me to see i'm really excited to see this project but also for our um for our audience watching. Unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our time. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for presenting such a rich presentation with so much good work. Um, and it's really wonderful to hear from you. Thank you so thank much. You. No, no, thank you for having me. I'm glad to, to be able to share some of these, these, these lessons, yeah. Yeah, such a great pleasure. And you have very lucky students out there in Vancouver who get to uh, benefit from your wisdom on a more regular basis. And we're so grateful to have this experience uh, in our archive. Um, so thank you so much for being with us today, Vlad. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to you who've been watching this uh, time. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. And if you enjoyed this presentation, I hope that you'll donate. The link is in the chat. And I hope that you'll join us for the remaining sessions that we have before the end of our symposium on Monday. Uh, if you are interested in the Touch Designer software, the program that Vlad used in the Peer Project, uh, you can find that we have a workshop on it this weekend, led by Andrew Scriver, one of our co-curators. And also we've done um, some conversations with Matthew Reagan, who is a, a pioneer in the touch design community and you can find those in our archive as well so if there's any materials from this session which interested you it will all be available in the archive um, and you'll be able to follow up with Vlad through the links which are posted right now in the chat so thanks again for joining us and I hope that we see you um, in short order we have one more session today with heist and we're really excited to be hosting them all right talk talk again soon <laughs>